Bill Tucker, um, would I embarrass you to call you the Dean of Australian UFO researchers? That'd probably be embarrassing, yeah. yeah. But true, <laughs> true. Yeah. Uh, let other people um, express that, I guess. Yeah. Have, have you uh, b become accustomed to using UAP instead of UFO? Uh, I know my friend Keith Bassfield has gone that path, but I, I'm still pretty comfortable with UFOs. I, th I think uh, U UAPs to me still sort of uh, has the situation where you you kind of have an elephant in the room, you know, and uh, it's uh, you, you got to notice it and call it what it is. I think and UAP yeah. tends to, uh, it, from my experience, tends to limit it to uh, I guess lights in the sky and and amorphous phenomena and that kind of stuff. But, you know, I, I'm open to whatever you want to call it. Well, UAP also has sort of a, <clears throat> an imprint of the Pentagon on it. You know, it's their term for it. Yeah, well, I, I wouldn't necessarily use the Pentagon's imprint, but uh, That's right. <laughs> um, it, it, it is a more scientific term. So I guess with my background in science, yeah, I'm comfortable with, with whatever we call it. I, I wanted to talk to you uh, through this mechanism and through Mystery Wire to let our viewers know you know, a lot of Americans who follow the UFO topic, they think it sort of stops at the borders of the U.S., East Coast and West Coast, and they don't recognize the ufology, the kind of research that, that takes place around the world. And you've been at it for a long time. I read that you you became interested in the topic as a teenager, which must have been, what, 1992? <laughs> yeah, that'd be right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, I mean, all the research that takes out uh, takes place around the world, including in Australia, doesn't get a lot of recognition here, but it's quality work. You've been at this a long time. Yeah, I, I think I think that's part of the problem. That's uh, it was interesting for me, particularly during the uh, late sixties, early seventies. I, I became a member of uh, Jim and Coral Lorenzen's organization, APRO, and uh, what I liked about that organization was that it had quite very impressive um, uh, international credentials, and I think probably more than any group at the time that was doing more to uh, highlight the fact that this is an international UFO phenomenon. And, um, you know, there were researchers right around the world and APRO had quite a good representation from right, right around the world, more so than other organizations in America at that time. You did become interested as a teenager. You started reading uh, about UFOs, learning what you could. And then in 1969, the same year that Blue Book was canceled, the same year that, that a, a Condon report came out, you took umbrage at that at at the effect that those decisions made, that it sort of said there's nothing to UFOs, and it it made you more resolved to find out what was going on. Yeah, well, I was basically a high school kid um, who had uh, access to the local uh, town library, school library, and all that kind of stuff, and I was reading Lloyd Mallon's articles, I think, what was it in Popular Mechanics or Popular Science or something like that, and he was writing a whole series of uh, UFO-related articles, and uh, at the time, my... Uh, librarian sort of looked over my shoulder to see uh, uh, what I was doing and um, sort of I was looking at all these sort of science related articles about UFOs uh, being reported in the American magazines and, and a couple of days later she came back with her own uh, personal copy of, um, God help me when I say this, Georgia Damsky and Desmond Leslie's book, uh, Fly, you know, Flying Saucers Have Landed, so it was her own personal copy which she gifted to me and uh, wished me well in my studies. So, that was the school librarian. So, and and when I went back to the school for a reunion, I think in about the year two thousand or something, the, the the principal of the school actually um, um, was talking to me. We went into the, the revised, brand new library, and there's a copy of my book, The Oz File, the Australian UFO Story. So I've got this picture of uh, signing my book uh, in the school library for a future <laughs> generation of readers. So, so it was good fun. Well, your first UFO book was Adamski. Mine was a, a picture book, Billy Myers, uh, the Billy Myers book, one of Wendell Stevens' books, which somebody gave yep. me as a gift in the 1970s. You all have to start somewhere, right? That's right, yes. Yeah. So I've I, I got, I got to say, um, I didn't find Adamski, Leslie's book, very uh, impressive, but it, it sort of encouraged me to do a lot of, you know, sort of direct research in the original materials. And, that showed up a lot of issues and that kind of stuff with the material that they were, they were promoting and that kind of thing. That's the challenge, isn't it? Separating wheat from chaff, figuring out what's real yep. and what isn't, and 90% of it is not very reliable. Yeah, well, I've been doing that for decades. So, yeah, there's a lot of, lot of wheat and chaff. Yeah. 
1969, the same year we're talking about, you had some events right in your backyard. I remember the first time I ever saw a picture of what we now call crop, crop circles. It was called a saucer's nest, and it was from in Australia. Uh, these happened yeah, that, right in your backyard, right? Yeah, that was actually uh, Tully that you're probably thinking of. That was 1966. That sort of really oh. gave the, the term uh, flying saucer nest, et cetera, up in far north Queensland. And that's a fairly famous case. Not, I've spent a lot of time there and and, uh, and and looking at that case. And in fact, I, I was I, re I revisited Tully back in the early 70s and uh, it was uh, the owner's son or one of the owner's sons that uh, informed me when I was actually had gone into the Horseshoe Lagoon where the nest had, that had been found back in 1966. And there'd been a, quite a number of those uh, so-called uh, saucer nests found in the lagoon. And uh, I'd gone into the lagoon and swam into the lagoon and, um, it has varying sort of depth depending on the, the season of the year. And uh, it was until after I got into the water, he told me, oh, you better look out for the Taipan snakes. <laughs> and uh, he reckoned that I launched like a UFO out of the water very, very quickly. And I said, you couldn't tell me that before I went into the lagoon, basically. And uh, it's one of the hazards of, of uh, you know, doing field research in, in northern Queensland. So you've got to, got to watch out for snakes and other uh, things that might do you harm. Uh, Harwood Island, you, you had some uh, incidents there early in your career of investigating these kind of cases, and these are not nebulous sort of sightings. These were distinct, not grainy at all, distinct kind of craft that people were seeing right in front of their eyes, right? Yeah, yeah. That, that I think you're talking about 1969. Um, there was a whole cluster of um, these kind of trace events, uh, ground traces, nests, or whatever you want to refer to them as, right up and down the north coast of New South Wales. and. Uh, um, one of them was on the property of the uh, local member of, uh, of uh, the New South Wales Parliament, Ian Robertson, and, and my father knew him, and uh, I got an invite to go out to the location, and there it, it made, it, it was a front page story right around Australia, probably because uh, it was on the property of a local parliamentarian, and uh, um, while there wasn't a direct UFO connection, uh, some flood mitigation workers had seen glowing top shaped things going out down into that property area the actual damage to the sackling crop was fairly extensive and it got a lot of attention but um, there were very few clear-cut UFO events until a couple of years later I got a letter from a woman living in Harwood Island um, who described an extraordinarily vivid close encounter uh, and uh, it turned out that the the date of that was very, very close to the discovery at the Bunga Walden property of the Parliamentarian and uh, the Harwell Island event. And, and, and geographically, they're not too far apart, but um, the Harwell Island woman uh, said that she's walking uh, beside this uh, sugarcane crop. Here's a sort of violent rustling. It's, it's, it's evening and uh, look towards the direction of the uh, disturbance. and. Uh, Saw what appeared to be like the high beam of a vehicle coming across the top of the, the sugarcane crop, and it, um, this high beam seemed to uh, switch off. It was she felt as though she was actually being levitated off the ground, and, and uh, it was quite a striking experience. Um, but when the high beam effect seemed to turn off, she could see this dish-shaped object, the dome, the whole whole thing, and it's uh, quite an interesting uh, close encounter. Very very impressive. It, it certainly revised my, uh, I guess, perceptions of a lot of these uh, so-called um, ground trace events or saucer nests or to use the other uh, uh, more modern go crop circles. I tend to re refrain from correlating crop circles with, with UFOs. It's, it's sort of a, a bit of a problematic controversy. Well, yeah, it's a leap, especially when you know humans do make a lot of them, if not most of them. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. You know, but uh, I have my uh, friend, who, um, Dr. Horace Drew, who uh, was my collaborator on the Hair of the Alien um, sort of work. And uh, as a personal hobby, he's obsessed with uh, sort of solving some of the uh, crop circle messages and all that kind of stuff. Now, you know, he and I argue about the, uh, I guess, the, the nature of that event or the nature of crop circles, whether it's alien or, or it's human design. I tend to err on human design more than anything. Uh, but he tends to feel that there is a tangible residue of cases there that's worthwhile looking into. You had your own sighting, right? It was on campus, uh, on college campus? 
1972, yeah, um, in, in uh, August, I think it was. Like, and uh, back in those days, I was, I was sort of partway through a science degree and uh, just finished a four hour practical class, which meant that uh, you'd get out around about six o'clock and what you were fixated on was tearing down the hill from the university uh, buildings themselves uh, to get into the college dorm um, eatery there so, uh, before it closed. And, and so I'm rushing across my college dormitory area, the quadrangle. I see two people, one of them I was familiar with vaguely, and uh, he's pointing up in the sky and um, uh, saying, can you see uh, what I can see to his girlfriend? And uh, uh, and he, and he, and he, they, she doesn't want to see it. And um, I, I thought, what, what are they talking about? I look up and I see this egg-shaped metallic thing sort of passing over what appeared to be uh, around about 200 feet altitude. Very hard to confirm that, but if it was uh, any um, higher, it would have been a massive object. And uh, uh, I got to have a clear-cut look at it. It was about twilight, so there's still a little bit of uh, light about. And uh, I felt that it was moving so steadily that if it was something like a balloon or or a Mr. C aircraft, but it, it seemed very definitely a, a round metallic object. I'd be able to still see it as I went through the laundry area, which was a fairly narrow um, building space. And on the other side was a huge open area of um, uh, sports fields and that kind of stuff. And I rushed through and to my astonishment, there was nothing there. Um, and I thought, what, what the hell's going on here? If it had been a balloon or uh, aircraft or something misperceived, I would have still been able to clearly perceive it. Uh, of course, I rushed back again, uh, nothing inside, but um, um, checked out local authorities and uh, couldn't explain what, what I observed. So, uh, so that was a really interesting sighting. But uh, what amazed me was that at the time, um, actually, as, as it turned out, early in the day, um, I'd had a... Um, an encounter with a, a gentleman who, who was aware that I was a member of the, the newly formed uh, University of New England uh, Psychic Phenomena Research Society. And I'd been ordained as the uh, chairman of the Ghost and uh, Poltergeist Subcommittee. <laughs> and, uh, and, and for me, that was just a catch-all, you know, because basically during that era, during the 70s, um, there was still a lot of uh, um, sort of controversy about psychic researchers and UFOs, never the two would meet kind of thing. And there was no reason why we should be looking at either phenomena and linking the two. Uh, so therefore, um, to me, I was kind of open to it because I was coming across case after case that had these sort of apparent paranormal connections and all that kind of thing. And uh, uh, this gentleman uh, who was familiar with me being connected with the society actually uh, said um, it was a pretty weird thing that happened out at Mount Butler, this little um, farming uh, location on the outskirts the skirts of Armidale, which is where the university was located, University of New England. And I said, well, what did uh, you see? And he described that these people had encountered a monk in a shroud that kind of possessed one of the individuals there. And, and uh, a pretty amazing story, a very bizarre story. And that occurred on the morning of the same day that I had my daylight sighting. So um, that led me out to that location, Mount Butler. Um, and as it was the case with a lot of university students who were tired of dormitory living, they tended to you know, go out to the um, farming locations and then start living on properties and that kind of stuff around, around the town. And as it turned out, Mount Butler was the location of ongoing UFO activity, kind of a little mini version of uh, the old Skinwalker situation. So it was a pretty weird time. Lots of multiple <laughs> UFO events, psychic, paranormal events, all that kind of thing. I was going to say, you know, Skinwalker, I, I got to come down to meet you some years ago and, and spend some time in Australia and had a talk about that um, a presentation. And it seemed like we find out more and more about places where it's it's not a really simple case of a UFO seen in the sky, a structured craft, that there's a lot of high strangeness surrounding these events mixed together. It makes it very hard for people like you to figure it out. Um, is is science the right um, the right framework to to figure this, these mysteries out. And have you ever, I know you've had a lot of scientific training and education, have you ever allowed yourself to reach a conclusion such as they're extraterrestrial, they're interdimensional, or is it just always gonna be a big question mark? Uh, big loaded question there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, 
Yeah, look, um, I, I think science, you know, I, I, I'm an advocate of a multidisciplinary approach, you know, um, but science, when used properly uh, with the right equipment and all that kind of thing, can be a very powerful tool to help calibrate whatever you investigate and research. And, and so it, it gives you the opportunity of anchoring stuff in, in, in a kind of a, a fairly well-documented way. That was the approach that I used when I wrote Hair of the Alien. Like, we had an extraordinarily complicated case, but we used scientific testing, genetic testing, um, uh, and that kind of thing to try and document whether it was a substantial mystery. And I think people in general should use science and whatever equipment and facilities we've got to try and, I guess, assess the credibility of cases, etc. I, I know that even since writing the book here with the Island, which came out in 2005, there's still a reluctance throughout the whole abduction field to apply genetic testing uh, to verify a lot of the claims that are made. And yet, we've done all this work and published it um, between 2000 and 2005, and, and yet very few people have attempted to replicate it with other cases. Well, we'll talk about here at the alien in a minute. I, just the general idea of science taking on these topics. You know how it is in your country as well as here, especially here. Science doesn't want to touch it. There's there's a reluctance, especially if you mix in skinwalkers and ghosts and psychic phenomena, things like that. It's hard enough just get, getting them to look at UFO evidence. Yeah, well, uh, George, you, you'd, you'd appreciate this very well. That uh, and the, the whole concept of the invisible college, that kind of thing. There's been manifestations of the Invisible college right around the world, etc. And and to explain the invisible college for those unaware of it, it's basically that cluster of interested scientists who are keen to research the UFO field. They know full well that uh, up until recently, it and it still is, I guess, a taboo topic. And doesn't give you many brownie points for uh, sort of extending your uh, research credentials and that kind of stuff. And you know, and in the interest of self preservation. Those scientists that often are deeply interested in UFO subjects will do it, and uh, but from an invisible college point of view, uh, stay anonymous, below the radar, that kind of thing. Increasing number of them have come out in the open, and we all know that the, the various people that have come out in the open, etc., and they cop a lot of controversy and that kind of thing. But um, there are an amazing number of, of scientists worldwide that are interested, and once you start to get deep into research, you start to make those connections. And I've certainly done that with a lot of scientists here in Australia. Let's talk about your books. Oz Files is the first one. Terrific overview of Australian UFO cases. Hair of the Alien is exactly what we're talking about. If you want to look for physical evidence and apply science to a case, this is one where it really worked and, and the results were astonishing. Can you give us a capsulization of that? Yeah. Well, the whole point of the book was essentially trying to apply science to a very controversial sample, et cetera. Uh, and I, I've got to be honest and frank, initially I kind of felt that the chances of anything interesting and unusual coming out uh, was going to be uh, pretty remote. And I said that to Peter Curie, the person who provided the hair sample. And, and to cut a long story short, he had an, an abduction experience or what appeared to be an abduction experience. Uh, but unlike most abductions uh, experiences, he had what appeared to be physical proof, and that was the hair sample. Um, I suggest people read the book or the, uh, yeah. all the various web articles on my own side to get into the detail, because it is extremely confronting, controversial, um, but we thought, let's apply uh, DNA forensic techniques to it, see where we go with this story. I said to Peter, big risk if these details come back, and I suspected that they would come back as very prosaic, very ordinary, he would have a lot of explaining to do with his part and, and uh, uh, as to the nature of the sample. Um, but to the consternation of both myself and the research scientists associated with the case, um, it came back pretty unusual. Here we had a, a blonde hair sample, sort of almost optically clear, uh, showing what appeared to be um, rare Asian mongoloid DNA um, from a very a rare sort of um, subgroup um, in Asia. And at that time, when we did the original work, uh, access to the Asian uh, genetic data be uh, base was pretty limited. But uh, my associate, who, who was the D uh, DNA biochemist, and that is now come out public, 
is Dr. Horace Drew. Now he was a senior research scientist with these uh, major uh, government defense, uh, government uh, science organization rather. And uh, it does all the sort of the Commonwealth of Australia kind of advanced research, that kind of thing. And, and he, he was a well-regarded scientist. In fact, the co-author of uh, uh, understanding DNA, one of the standard textbooks um, that postgrad people have got to uh, um, use as a, as a textbook, that kind of stuff. So I knew that the work being done on the case was done by a highly credible person supervising the research. So uh, it showed, uh, and a lot of people don't get this, is that what we seem to come up with was essentially a hybrid hair sample uh, because we had the benefit of uh, replicating the work in, in the shaft that, that showed the rare Asian mongoloid DNA in the root. Uh, we knew we were only going to get one chance at this. This showed basically a rare Basque DNA. Uh, and that stunned the researchers simply because in the root, in the, root the shaft, skin, whatever, um, you should get basically consistent DNA. Here we're getting inconsistent DNA, but being replicated. Uh, uh, we had uh, the shaft with one set of DNA and the root showing a different type, and we could not understand it. And, uh, and eventually we, we concluded that this seemed to be the result of some sort of advanced cloning technique. And also we had evidence um, uh, in the nuclear DNA that this person uh, who donated the hair, I guess you could say, um, had what appeared to be CCR5 deletion factor, which um, is an interesting property because it, it leads you to be um, perhaps impervious to things like smallpox, AIDS, that kind of thing. So that would be a very handy uh, thing to have. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not shared that widely ar around the earth. Uh, they have this constellation of unusual DNA properties within one small hand, uh, hair sample. Um, it was, was bizarre. And that's why we essentially wrote the book. Uh, and, uh, uh, it, it, but essentially, it was the result of an attempt to show what science could possibly do, either explain the case, which we initially suspected it would do, or uh, verify that there was something unusual. In this case, it, it verified something unusual. Did the witness uh, describe the, the being that, alien, that abducted him? Was it a, was it a blonde? Yes. Uh, Peter Curie, the witness, he was a, um, um, a gentleman who born in Lebanon, uh, Christian Maronite background. Uh, his family uh, emigrated to Australia. Um, he had a um, basically a cement rendering business at the time. He had this. Uh, he was recovering from a job injury um, it, and um, was spending a lot of time at home. Uh, he'd drop his wife off to the, the local radio station, who was the only breadwinner at that time. So it was a lot. A lot of stress going on in, in the family simply because um, he was recovering from this work injury and wanting to get back into the work work situation, um, but has this experience of uh, a blonde haired woman, Nordic looking, turning up in the house. Um, it, it's a very bizarre story. And I hope people, when they don't go on just a soundbite that we, we're giving here, they should go to my, my own uh, blog site. Um, uh, check out the linked website, which, is, which I've referred to as Alien DNA Paradigm. Uh, that's the name of the blog. It's linked on my Ozfiles blog. Um, that gives you a very detailed account of this case. It's an incredibly complicated case. Uh, trying to distill literally over a decade's <laughs> worth of research into a five-minute soundbite is impossible. Basically. Understood. You did a great job, yeah. though. Um, yeah, but... but it's, couple... it's, yeah. Go ahead. We'll put up the link so they can find your work and we'll send people there. And also, Hair of the Aliens, a terrific read anyway. Uh, let me yeah. ask you this in the time we have left. China, um, the Chinese government, you've made a point of trying to find out what's going on in China, UFO-wise. Um, can you talk about the, the UFO picture, how tough it is to get information from China, and in particular, how tough it is to get information from the Chinese government? Yeah, well, I, I was already a, a bit of a sinophile, that, that, that kind of uh, species of people that basically are uh, fascinated by the Chinese, um, I guess, cultural and historical situation, all the rest of it doesn't necessarily mean I, I, I definitely don't endorse the Chinese sort of uh, 
um, current government system, etc. I prefer to see a free and open society here, but uh, um, it, it's been a fascinating area for me. And it was actually the Hero the, the Alien investigation that really got me keen to go to China itself to investigate the rare Asian mongoloid DNA. And that was one of the, the primary impetuses for going to China. And I got some limited funding, I was able to go to China, eventually went to China uh, basically three times over the space of, uh, I think it was 2001, 2005, 2006, and got to meet a large number of Chinese researchers. And the level of scientific interest was really intriguing, you know, like DNA specialists uh, interested in the phenomena, a lot of engineering types, that kind of stuff. Um, Essentially, there were a lot of um, researchers that were examining this and uh, um, there, there was evidence of um, government interest, but, but mainly I was getting it from um, scientists that were interested. They seemed to be more open to it. Uh, what dismayed me was uh, given the Chinese communist regime, they, they didn't show a great deal of tolerance for uh, I guess, mystical or new age kind of uh, stuff that was outside the uh, narrow range of what should be a science focus, but yet they tolerated um, the scientific interest in UFOs. And when it got into rather strange pastures like abduction cases, which I, I did get to examine a few cases in China directly, um, it it was getting into some pretty controversial areas, which I thought would have got a lot of negative blowback from the government to these Chinese organisations. Actually, the first year that I, I visited China, um, it was very difficult to make contact with um, UFO researchers in China. It turned out that um, Falun Gong uh, had apparently intercepted a radio station were broadcasting messages and that was the beginning of the suppression of Falun Gong. And unfortunately, Falun Gong uses a little bit of contact to kind of uh, aspects to uh, promote their, their religion, their meditation, cult, whatever you want to refer to it as. So uh, it made it very problematical on that first visit. So uh, I learned that most of the researchers were keeping a low profile at that time. But certainly in 2005 and 2006, that was much different. Uh, because uh, I was able to access the groups, attend the Dalian UFO conference, and in the subsequent year, did a, um, a, a trip that was devoted to evaluating the Chinese connection to the hair sample in Peter Kuru's case. So I was able to do a lot of interesting research in China. I had heard they had UFO groups, organizations uh, that might They're be a everywhere. million people in them. They're huge. They're everywhere. Uh, you know, there's a few of the major groups that are quite uh, well established in Beijing, um, in Shanghai, and also in uh, Kuming. Kuming um, in Yunnan province, I spent a lot of time at. I actually lectured to the science faculty at the University of Yunnan, and members of the physics faculty and a number of the chemistry faculty, that kind of thing, they were members of the UFO group, so, the lecturers. Uh let me ask about something called solid light. You did some work, you found some information about something called solid light, which I did not understand. Can you describe that, what it is? Well, solid light's a terminology that I think it was originally adopted by the Belgians or French researchers to account for cases that were occurring in Europe in particular um, and South America uh, and in other locations, as it turned out, that it, uh, involved UFOs that seemed to project beams of light. But these beams of light didn't behave in the normal way that uh, uh, we humans are used to, like uh, these would be kind of um, non-divergent, would often be truncated, um, slow progression. Um, so it, it, it's kind of controversial properties uh, that seem to indicate that whatever the UFOs were, they were using light technology or might have been an analogue of light that was far beyond what we were capable of doing uh, and still are. Uh, basically, we're, we're seeing cutting edge type of research used as uh, various um, media mediums that allow us to manipulate light to a limited extent. We can slow down light, all that kind of stuff, manipulate light, but nothing of the order that's being seen in UFO accounts right around the world. Um, and, and so there's 
Uh, I, I think there's a lot of potential scientific pay dirt if we examine those sorts of cases of solid light. And that's something that I've been focused on for a long, long time. You know, here in the US, you've read about ATIP, OSAP, some, you know, the New York Times stories. There has been some crack in the wall of secrecy a little bit. A lot of people maybe are exaggerated in their expectations. They think disclosures right around the world. I suspect that you and I are both not holding our breath, waiting for that to happen. But Look, I wanted I, to know. I, I, Go ahead. I'm not really an advocate of pursuing. Um, you know, I've, I've done the hard yards. I've had access to the Australian government UFO files, etc. I examined the bulk of their files, etc. When I had access between um, 2004 uh, uh, or up to 2004 in four separate visits and I spent multiple days going through thousands of files and what I saw was basically being replicated by civilian research and that kind of thing but what I didn't see a great deal of was evidence of good solid science in these files and that they, they keep referring to the scientific record. That scientific record I'm afraid didn't exist to a great extent in the government files, the UFO files. Um, I saw more evidence of good solid science in civilian research um, but I did get to meet a lot of government defence scientists and that kind of stuff once they started to become aware that I was trying to access information. So I was making connections with government scientists who were below the radar and some of these people came out in the open. Um, so I was kind of amazed with some of the people that were actually involved in the field, like chief government defence scientists, um, the head of the Joint Intelligence Organisation's nuclear science section, Harry Turner, nuclear physicist, who wrote a secret report in 1954 that suggested that UFOs were poss possibly extraterrestrial. Um, so that was back in 1954. Um, that was his own private view, of course, uh, based on data that he had looked at. Um, but when you get that kind of feedback, you think there's something surely going on. But my point here is that government organisations or whatever they're doing on UFOs, it's always under the radar. It's always stovepiped. It's always very hard to get the complete picture and, and so that's why i'm an advocate of open scientific investigation um it's hard enough trying to figure it out what's going on but when you you get, got half the story being kept away from you and blocked it, it, you're dealing with shadows all the time and that's why i'm a real advocate of sharing information open science do you um happen to think that there are Australian government files that you were not given access to, national security cases. And I ask it for the reason, the same reason here is we're, we've seen cracks in the wall a little bit. We get to see some files, but the really good stuff, the really sensitive cases, we haven't seen those. <clears throat> yeah, I've, I've got to give a qualified response to this because I've had, well, I guess, communication and ongoing kind of contact with a number of what, what I guess you'd call for want of a better word, deep throat type sources that claim to be members of kind of um, organisations that are actually outside of government, you know, that the, 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 the controversial um, uh, Admiral Wilson document, or, or, uh, that becomes a, a very interesting kind of um, point to look at because when I saw that, and I was aware of bits and pieces of it before that, but when it became highly public, the point that resonated with me was the suggestion that here we are dealing with uh, a secret kind of attempt to examine UFOs, but outside of the military and within aerospace, um, who still obviously had deep connections with the military. And that uh, caused me to reconsider uh, uh, connecting with a person that had been in contact with me that suggested that very thing decades earlier and so I reconnected with that person uh, that person's been telling me ongoing information about being part of a worldwide kind of um, effort that basically rooted in aerospace non-government connections they have kind of connections with governments around the world but it is essentially a privatized aerospace kind of connection and this gentleman I've met, I've interviewed, that kind of thing. But once again, you're kind of dealing with a, a frustrating angle that yeah. nothing has been handed across that would allow you to verify this. Now, now dot the I's, cross the T's, that kind of thing. It, it's always 
impossible to confirm, but a very compelling kind of story. I just know that American allies, allies of our Department of Defense, kind of follow the the path set out by the Pentagon when it comes to UFOs. That's been true for the UK and Australia. And I didn't know if with the crack in the wall here in the US a little bit, whether that had changed anything in your country. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not, not detecting huge changes at this point in time. Um, it, it, it's kind of, uh, you know, a lot of us are trying to revisit all the past connections to see whether there's been changes of policy. But essentially, officially, the Australian government is out of the UFO game. Uh, but there's clear evidence that they are still investigating through various departments, um, UAP or UFO cases, etc. We tend not to use the word UFO. Our government in the past has used UAS, which is an unusual aerial sighting. So even oh. more kind of, um, sort of uh, obscuring details and terminology, etc. No, I've lost count of the number of kind of abbreviations for the yeah. UFO phenomenon. Yeah. yeah, AAV is another one. AAV yeah, is yeah, yeah, something, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's like to, a long list. Yep. It's great to talk to you. We'll send people to your blogs, blog, blog spot. I encourage them to check out your books. I hope I get a chance to see you again sometime when the world gets back Likewise. to normal, if that ever happens.